Sun Worship It is one of the oldest practices of pagan idolatry on earth that can be traced to every continent and virtually every culture in the pre-Christian world. The oldest culture on earth, Babylon, worshipped the sun whose name was Shamash. He was usually depicted as a circle with eight rays of the sun. Sir E. A. Wallace Budge, one of the greatest antiquity scholars of the 20th century, analyzed many of the Babylonian cylinder seals where Shamash is usually represented as rising between two mountains, for the Babylonians believed that each mountain had a door. When the sun rose in the east, it opened the eastern door in the morning. And when the sun set and disappeared in the west, it went through the western door in the evening. Babylon's younger sister culture, the Assyrians, worshipped the sun whose name was Asher, who was also their chief deity. He was usually depicted as a winged figure in a circle, sometimes with a bow and arrow in artwork when they were going to war. The Assyrians were heavily influenced by both the Babylonian and the Egyptian culture, where the Egyptian sun god like the Assyrians was also depicted as a circle with wings. Whether it was titled Ra or the Aten under the fear of Akhenaten, it was the same pagan sun deity. In Volume 1 of History of Ancient Egypt published in 1881, George Rawlinson, Camden Professor of Ancient History in the University of Oxford, documented how sun worship dominated every aspect of the ancient Egyptian culture. The Egyptians were profoundly religious. All knew that there was one god and understood that when worship was offered to Kem or Nef or Ta or Maut or Thoth or Ammon, the one god was worshipped under some one of his forms or in some one of his aspects. Ra was not a sun deity with a distinct and separate existence, but the supreme god acting in the sun, making his light to shine on the earth, warming, cheering and blessing it and so Ra might be worshipped with all the titles of honour. No matter what deity was worshipped in Egypt, it represented the sun god. And this pagan idolatry changed the glory of the uncorruptible god into an image made like to corruptible man, and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things, the Holy Scripture says. The scarab beetle was one of the most famous of the Egyptian deities. It can be found everywhere. When the beetle rolled dung, the Egyptians superstitiously believed that the beetle was the sky god who was rolling the sun across the heavens. It was viewed as the emissary of the sun and was mentioned in the Egyptian book of the dead. And nearly every monument, manuscript or Egyptian artifact, the sun god is depicted with different deities and different pharaohs. In the Americas, the sun god was usually represented in human form, sometimes in a reserved seated position. In Mesoamerica, there were temples dedicated to the sun in places like Teotihuacan in Mexico, and the Aztecs continued from their predecessors offered human sacrifices to him. While all the civilizations mentioned no longer exist, in India, the sun god is still worshipped, and the name is Sura and mantras or prayers are offered to it. The 13th century AD Konark Sun Temple that is still in use is adorned in its artwork with the same eight-rayed wheel or rays of the sun that was incorporated from the culture of ancient Babylon. The only pre-Christian culture on earth that didn't worship the sun were the children of Israel. And there was one thing that singled them out from all the other nations on earth to prevent them from sinking into pagan idolatry. God said, Six days may work be done, but in the seventh is the Sabbath of rest. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. But when the children of Israel strayed from God, it was always the sun that replaced the worship of God. That ball of fire that God created on the fourth day of creation to rule over the day 
and was for signs and seasons, became their God, and this idolatry was unequivocally condemned. God said, Then said he unto me, Hast thou seen this, O son of man? Turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations than these. And he brought me into the inner court of the Lord's house, and, behold, at the door of the temple of the Lord, between the porch and the altar, were about five and twenty men, with their backs toward the temple of the Lord, and their faces toward the east, and they worshipped the sun toward the east. There was one culture that amalgamated both the Eastern or Oriental culture and the Greek or Western culture into one, the Roman Empire. Having one of the most vast empires, its faithful soldiers were its strength, and it was renowned for its colosseums all over its empire, where its gladiators fought gruesome and bloody battles in its arenas, its entertainment industry or Hollywood of the day. Its famous sun deities were adopted from the east, and it was called Sol, where we get the name Solar System. These sun gods from Rome can still be found today. In this monument from ancient Rome, you can see a smiling sun within a wreath. This has now become the logo of the United Nations. The god Mithra was sometimes depicted with the rays of the sun coming out of his head. And this was the gift French Freemasons gave to the United States that is now called the Statue of Liberty. But when Rome was at its height, and when Caesar Augustus restored paganism to its zenith by rebuilding all the pagan temples, one was to be born that was to counteract the pagan idolatry of ancient Rome. Prince Emmanuel, the Lion of the tribe of Judah. When Jesus came to reverse the effects of the fall, he instituted two things that would clearly distinguish him from all the false sun gods that existed before him. And he said unto them, The Sabbath was made for man, and not man for the Sabbath. Therefore the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. And he took bread, and gave thanks, and brake it, and gave unto them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. Unlike the Hebrew Passover, that was to be clearly kept on the 14th day of the month, Abib or Nisan, Jesus, the Lord of the Sabbath, our Passover, can be kept on any day, week, or month. Jesus was crucified in a horrific death to pay the price of sin, and he died on one of the very insignias of the sun god, the cross. And it wasn't long before this symbol was incorporated into the church. When the ancients looked at the sun and saw its rays shining out from it, the cross later became a symbol for the sun. The Babylonians had the cross on their slender seals in obeisance for the sun god Shamash, and the Assyrian monarchs wore the cross or sun god around their necks in full recognition of their homage to the sun. And on Egyptian monuments, the cross can be found etched in stone where it either looks like a hot cross bun or the ankh. Egyptian priests also wore the ankh around their necks like the Assyrian kings and even the Mesoamerican culture, the Omex, had the two crosses on their apparel. If there is one system that sun worship has been preserved in its entirety, it's the papacy, whose headquarters is Vatican City. In the main square in Vatican City, facing St. Peter's Basilica, is one of the oldest symbols of the sun, and people walk over it without in the least being aware of it. From an aerial view, the Vatican Square has the eight-rayed sun wheel, the largest on earth, that forms into the shape of a phallus. And it can be traced back to the Babylonian sun god, Shamash, who has his eight rays. As you walk into St. Peter's Basilica in the Vatican and tour around, sun worship symbols are everywhere. 
but as you look into a corner, you see a statue of a woman holding the sun god in her arms, which shows the pagan mysteries have not died. You'll also see a pagan sun god with a halo or sun on its head, who the Vatican calls Saint Peter. It's not Peter, it's the sun god, and the halo can be traced to the Eastern cultures where the Buddhist and Hindu religions adorned their deities with the sun behind its head. And you can see that Catholic art tried to paganize Jesus Christ and show images of him with the halo, where critics assert that Jesus is not the son of God, but the sun God. Even the image of Jesus was borrowed from the pagan world. Look at this image of the Greek god Zeus, who they call the father of the gods. And when you go into the Vatican and look at the images of who they say is Jesus with a halo on his head, it is Zeus, not Christ. But this is the image that dominates Christendom, Zeus. Even rappers have made Zeus their top bling iconic Jesus piece figure that they adorn around their necks. The wedding ring is also from sun worship and has been incorporated into the church. The man who introduced the paganization of Christianity is Roman Emperor Constantine, whose bogus conversion caused the greatest damage to the purity of apostolic Christianity. His contemporary Eusebius recorded a list of all the pagan customs he introduced into the church, and Cardinal John Henry Newman the Anglican convert to Catholicism who was beatified in England in September 2010 documented all the paganisms that came in. We are told in various ways by Eusebius that Constantine, in order to recommend the new religion to the heathen, transferred into it the ornaments to which they had been accustomed in their own. The use of temples and these dedicated to particular saints and ornamented on occasions with branches of trees Incense, lamps and candles, votive offerings on recovery from illness, holy water, asylums, holy days and seasons, use of calendars, processions, blessings on the fields, sacerdotal vestments, the tonsure, the ring in marriage, turning to the east, images at a later date, perhaps the ecclesiastical chant and the Cairo Elysium are all of pagan origin and sanctified by their adoption into the church. The Vatican has openly declared that every ritual in her system was adopted from paganism. And Christians who claim to be separate from her do not have much to challenge her on, for they also have adopted many of these pagan practices. And when critics attack Christianity as being nothing more than a scam, and a continuation of the sun worshipping Mithraic religion of Rome, they find it impossible to defend themselves. So sun worship still survives in most of the mainstream Christian churches. Let us observe them step by step. In the first edition of the Catholic Encyclopedia, Volume 5, it clearly documents where the pagan custom of Easter originated from. Easter the English term, according to the Venerable Bede, De Temporium Ration 1 5, relates to Eostra, a Teutonic goddess of the rising light of day and spring. William Tyler Olcott, in his well researched book titled Sun Law of All Ages, also confirms this. He says, In short, sun worship, symbolically speaking, lies at the very heart of of the great festivals which the Christian Church celebrates today. The Christian festival of Easter has its solar characteristics. The very word Easter, says Proctor, is in its real origin as closely related to sun movements as the word East. And the notion that the sun dances on Easter morning as it rises is firmly believed today by superstitious people. In Saxony and Brandenburg, the peasants still climb the hilltops before dawn on Easter day to witness the three joyful leaps of the sun as our English forefathers used to do. Tyler tells us that the solar rite of the new fire adopted by the Roman church was a paschal ceremony 
may still be witnessed in Europe with its solemn curfew on Easter Eve and the ceremonial striking at the new holy fire. It is said that stores make their highest sales at Christmas time. And the season is a very profitable time for companies where people frantically buy gifts to please family and friends. But even though most Christians in the West will fanatically defend it, giving no scriptural support, who is it really in honour of? The Canadian-born Freemason, Manly Palmer Hall, who is considered as one of the most respected esoteric scholars in the 20th century, tells us its pagan roots. For reasons which they doubtless consider sufficient, those who chronicled the life and act of Jesus found it advisable to metamorphize him into a solar deity. Sun worship played an important part in nearly all the pagan mysteries. The pagans set aside the 25th of December as the birthday of the solar man. They rejoiced, feasted, gathered in processions and made offerings in the temple. In fact, the merrymaking is rooted in paganism. The Bible never gives an exact date for Jesus' birth. So when the Christian church adopted December 25th, it was superimposing a Christian festival on a previously held pagan one, says Richard Heinberg, author of Celebrate the Solstice. The Roman winter solstice, says Tyler, as celebrated on December 25th, in connection with the worship of the sun god Mithra, appears to have been instituted in this special form by Aurelian about AD 273. And to this festival, the day owes its opposite name of the birthday of the unconquered sun, with full symbolic appropriateness, though not with historical justification, the day was adopted in the Western Church where it appears to have been generally introduced by the 4th century. The sun dominated nearly every feast in the pre-Christian occult world. On December 21st, the winter solstice, the ancients believed that the sun died and on December 25th it had its rebirth. But the ancients also had sacred trees it was like their own tree of life, which they revered and held sacred. In the 2009 film Avatar, pagan tree worship is connected with the spirits and ancestor worship, and it was one of the animus customs of many pagan tribes. This is a place for prayers to be heard, and sometimes answered. The voices of our ancestors. The Bible forbids any revering for pagan tree worship. For God wanted his people to be distinct from the world and not be manipulated by the movements of the sun in the heavens. Hear ye the word which the Lord speaketh unto you, O house of Israel. Thus saith the Lord, Learn not the way of the heathen, and be not dismayed at the signs of heaven, for the heathen are dismayed at them. For the customs of the people are vain. For one cutteth a tree out of the forest, the work of the hands of the workmen with the axe. They deck it with silver and with gold. They fasten it with nails and with hammers, that it move not. They are upright as the palm tree, but speak not. They must needs be born because they cannot go. Be not afraid of them, for they cannot do evil, neither also is it in them to do good. For as much as there is none like unto thee, O Lord, thou art great, and thy name is great in might. Today Christian pastors, so-called evangelists, scholars, and teachers, are now telling their congregations that Jeremiah is not talking about the Christmas tree though the language is so clear and they are encouraging their flock to purchase the trees and to celebrate Christmas. But even the secular world knows that the Christmas tree is tied to paganism 
and spirit worship. Even Jesus says in Luke chapter 16 and verse 8 to paraphrase, the secular world are more wiser than the children of light. Mistletoe, caroling, even Christmas trees were tied to the solstice. Celtic cultures believed that mistletoe's golden berries hold the fire of the sun, and Christmas trees are a vestige of pagan tree worship. Having Christmas trees again hark back to the pagans. They decorated the evergreen trees with decorations, food and runes to keep the spirits close to their villages. The Christian authorities tried for years to stamp this out, so the pagans merely took their trees indoors, which is why we are still doing it to this day. Who is Santa Claus and how does he tie into the Winter Solstice Sun Festival? He is usually portrayed as an oversized, big bearded figure who gives children gifts and in modern times he has been made popular through the marketing of Coca-Cola. Listen to the voice of the secular world. Saturn, the old man who lives at the North Pole and brings with him to the children of men a sprig of evergreen, the Christmas tree, is familiar to the little folks under the name of Santa Claus for he brings each winter the gift of the new year. Even Saint Nick has solstice origins. Santa Claus comes down to us with shamanistic characteristics. He flies through the air and he carries a magic sack on his back. But Easter and Christmas are not the only memorials to the sun. There is one more that the majority of Christians around the world keep that can be traced to the Roman religion of Mithraism. Manly Palmer Hall gives a clear and detailed account of this last homage to the sun. Alexander Wilder in his Philosophy and Ethics of the Zoroastrians states that Mithras is the Zend title for the sun. There are many points of resemblance between Christianity and the cult of Mithras. The Encyclopedia Britannica makes the following statement concerning the Mithraic and Christian mysteries. The sanctification of Sunday and of the 25th of December, the immortality of the soul, these are some of the resemblances which, whether real or only apparent, enabled Mithraism to prolong its resistance to Christianity. The Vatican has made a number of statements which has pushed for the preservation of this Mithraic day of rest, a day that Jesus never gave no disciple instruction to keep in memorial of his resurrection. In 1998, the late Pope John Paul II published a document to preserve this day. It was called Dies Domini, which translated is the Day of the Lord, where he bigs up both Sunday and the seventh day Sabbath of creation. The fundamental importance of Sunday has been recognized through 2,000 years of history and was emphatically restored by the Second Vatican Council. The Sabbath has therefore been interpreted evocatively as a determining element in the kind of sacred architecture of time. It recalls that the universe and history belongs to God. The Irish-American Catholic prelate Cardinal James Gibbons, Bishop of Baltimore, made a very powerful statement in his 1876 apologetics, The Faith of Our Fathers. He was no ordinary Catholic bishop. He was a powerful towering presence in United States politics. In this picture he stands in the center where he prays for President McKinley on the left and Admiral Dewey on the right in 1899. He was also very close with President Theodore Teddy Roosevelt, as seen in his photo in 1918. In this picture he stands on the furthest right, and fifth on the left is the bearded steel magnate, Scottish-born Andrew Carnegie, with President Howard Taft. Gibbons comments on this Mithraic memorial when he says, Is not every Christian obliged to sanctify Sunday? and to abstain on that day from servile work? 
Is not the observance of this law among the most prominent of our sacred duties? But you may read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation and you will not find a single line authorizing the sanctification of Sunday. The scriptures enforce the religious observance of Saturday, a day which we never sanctify. But the Vatican has put out a number of statements where they have rubbed it in the face of the vast majority of the Christian world that when they keep Sunday, it is not in obedience to Jesus Christ, but in obedience to the Catholic Church. They have even offered money to any Christian if they can prove the Mithraic Sunday worship from the Bible until this very day not one Christian has stood up to the challenge, the papacy. In a book called The Faith of Millions by a highly respected Catholic scholar, Reverend John A. O'Brien, originally published in 1938, it strikes a blow and a challenge to the majority of the Christian world. It reads, The word Sabbath means rest and is Saturday, the seventh day of the week. Why then do Christians observe Sunday instead of the day of the Bible? Since Saturday, not Sunday, is specified in the Bible, isn't it curious that non-Catholics who profess to take their religion directly from the Bible and not from the church observe Sunday instead of Saturday? They have continued the custom even though it rests upon the authority of the Catholic Church and not upon an explicit text in the Bible. The observance remains as a reminder of the Mother Church from which the non-Catholic sects broke away, like a boy running away from home but still carrying in his pocket a picture of his mother or a lock of her hair. So who is the God of Christmas? It sure ain't Jesus. Jesus never told anyone to keep the 25th of December holy. And though the word Easter is mentioned once, he didn't tell anyone to keep Easter, neither did he tell anyone to keep Sunday in memorial of the resurrection. The Holy Scriptures teaches that the new life that is lived should be kept in memorial of the resurrection. But while Christians will debate, argue, and fight over all these issues mentioned. Before Jesus Christ returns to take his faithful home into eternity, those who are faithful to him will be distinguished from all the others who profess his name. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed.